Chapter 13, Left-Wing Bias, an Infantile Disorder of Contemporary Philosophy. In intellectual circles, conservatives move quietly and discreetly, catching each other's eyes across the room like the homosexuals in Proust, whom that great writer compared to Homer's gods, known only to each other as they move in disguise around the world of mortals. Roger Scruton. Just as fish are not aware of the water they swim in, so too philosophers tend to be oblivious to their collective political bias while basking in the warm sun of campus leftism. The leading contemporary political philosopher, Tim Scanlon, from Harvard University, acknowledges this, at least in the abstract, writing that it is easy to see intolerance in one's opponents and harder to avoid it oneself. But Scanlon seems to be unaware that it was in the very preceding paragraph that he himself exhibited that same ideological one-sidedness and intolerance. Speaking about examples of intolerance that are all around us, he gave more than four instances of this regrettable phenomenon, and all of his illustrations come from the political right. He did not feel any need to show at least a semblance of impartiality and objectivity by citing for the sake of symmetry a single case of intolerance originating from the left. But am I not open to a similar charge myself? For how can I explain that practically all the examples discussed in this book are associated with the excesses of left-wing politics? Even Michael Dummett, who had conservative views on some issues, e.g. abortion, is here represented by the opinions that strongly aligned him with the far left of British politics. Why did I not, for the sake of fairness and balance, provide at least some examples of prominent analytic philosophers blundering politically in the right-wing direction. Is this a reflection of my bias? There is a bias for sure, but I suggest that it is in philosophy, not me. Academic philosophy, like other disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, has a notoriously strong leftist tilt. Therefore, it should not be surprising that there is a dearth of right-wing examples in my sample. In particular, within the highly exclusive group of the most eminent analytic philosophers, the main focus of this book, I managed to find only one case of a conservative who made the cut. But upon analysis, as the reader will see on 188 to 193, even that single case of a right-wing deviation provides additional evidence of the leftist bias in the philosophical community. Robert Nozick loses his nerve. There is something else at work here that makes the effect of political bias even stronger. Consider an academic discipline in which the ratio of left-wing to right-wing individuals is, say, 10 to 1. Such a ratio, and even higher, has been reported in some studies of the politics of academic philosophers. Would you expect that in that discipline, the ratio of those who publicly expressed extreme leftist views versus those who publicly expressed extreme rightist views would stay around the same value, 10 to 1. A moment of thought points to the negative answer. Other things being equal, there is reason to think that the ratio would rise significantly. Look at how different the situation would be for the two kinds of extremists. On one hand, the leftist extremists would be considered by a huge majority of their colleagues who share their basic political opinion as being a correct or almost correct, or b perhaps too radical but still having their heart in the right place, or c profoundly wrong but nevertheless not remotely as condemnable as the right-wing extremists. On the other hand, the right-wing extremists would be considered by the majority of scholars in their own discipline as irrational or dangerous or beyond the pale or evil or most or all of the above. Since one has to communicate on a daily basis with colleagues in one's discipline and find a basic modus vivendi with one's professional peers, it is clear that in such a situation, the pressure against the minority extremism would be enormous. Under the circumstances, many people who would otherwise be inclined toward extreme right-wing views would probably adopt a more moderate stance, while others might start having doubts and would realize they would be better off just keeping their opinion to themselves. This would result in the left-right ratio of the extreme views rising to a value much higher than 10 to 1, and the left-right ratio of publicly expressed extreme views would be even higher. 
According to a 2013-2014 study by the Higher Education Research Institute at the University of California, Los Angeles, the ratio of university professors who described themselves as politically far left versus those on the far right was between 30 to 1 and 50 to 1. The ratio for philosophers, however, must be considerably higher than that figure, which is the average across all academic disciplines. I think these facts must be a large part of the explanation for why so many leading analytic philosophers were Stalinists or Soviet sympathizers, whereas there is no single instance of anyone of a similar stature having publicly supported the supposed right-wing equivalent, a fascist leader, say, or even much less odious right-wing politicians such as, for example, Pinochet. A nice illustration of the effect of ideological majority pressure in philosophy is the case of Robert Nozick. He admitted that at one point he went along with the incorrect representation of his views just because he expected it would make his colleagues view him more favorably. It was so nice for people to be slapping me on the back and telling me that they had faith in me and they believed in me because they hadn't been saying that for years and they started welcoming me back into the fold. And you know, God help me. But I just like to not be vilified for a change. I like to not be a pariah in my own department. And so I went along with it. I could have done the snarky thing and said, no, your approval of me is based on a misunderstanding. I could have said that, but I just didn't. I was tired and I just let it go. It should be pointed out that at the time, the end of the 80s, Nozick was a tenured full professor at Harvard, widely admired for his intellectual brilliance. If despite his very high standing in the profession, he still felt like a pariah in his own department, it is not hard to guess how much worse the position must be for those younger, less accomplished, and much more vulnerable scholars who share his political views. They would be much more motivated to let their opinions be misrepresented in the left-wing direction not to mention that many of them might, under pressure, genuinely migrate away from beliefs that could sound outrageous to most of their colleagues. This is one of the mechanisms via which the high left-wing ratio might reinforce itself and increase further. Those dumb conservatives. Sometimes the political imbalance in academia is attributed to a putative correlation between being a conservative and having low intelligence. For example, in 2004, the Duke Conservative Union protested the underrepresentation of their ideological brethren among the Duke faculty. In the humanities and social sciences departments, the Democrat-Republican ratio of registered voters was higher than 17 to 1. Robert Brandon, then chair of the philosophy department and a prominent philosopher of science, gave the following explanation. We try to hire the best, smartest people available. If, as John Stuart Mill said, stupid people are generally conservative, then there are lots of conservatives we will never hire. Mill's analysis may go some way towards explaining the power of the Republican Party in our society and the relative scarcity of Republicans in academia. Players in the NBA tend to be taller than average. There's a good reason for this. Members of academia tend to be a bit smarter than average. There is a good reason for this, too. Although Brandon made the claim about a connection between conservatism and stupidity in his official capacity as the head of a highly ranked philosophy department, other philosophers did not have a problem with his statement, nor did they publicly criticize his argument. But several non-philosopher commentators wondered whether Brandon would be willing to extend the same logic to another context where it would seem to apply with no less force. John Zimmerman, a Duke alumnus, wrote, Professor Robert Brandon's arrogant, bigoted tantrum makes the lofty suggestion that conservatives are underrepresented because they're all stupid. The logic of his statement is incredible. Is he suggesting that Duke's black faculty initiative proves that blacks are stupid? Is there a quote from Mill to hide behind on that subject? Zimmerman was unfair to Brandon because Brandon neither said nor implied that all conservatives are stupid. But Zimmerman's main point was a good one. If it is legitimate to invoke the putative average difference in intelligence between two groups to explain the underrepresentation of one of them, conservatives, why then not explore whether the underrepresentation of blacks 
could be accounted for in the same way. The idea that a black-white difference in average intelligence might play some explanatory role cannot be dismissed out of hand. After all, the authoritative report, Intelligence, Knowns and Unknowns, issued by the American Psychological Association, states that the black mean is typically about one standard deviation, about 15 points, below that of whites. I am not taking sides here in either of the two debates. I am only interested in the strikingly different attitudes of philosophers toward two similar empirical hypotheses. While the suggestion that the low percentage of conservatives among university professors is due to their lower intelligence tends to produce agreement, amusement, or a disinterested shrug, the same idea about blacks is met with immediate rejection, outrage, and condemnation. A good illustration is the case of the philosopher Michael Levin, who in 1990 published a short letter in the Proceedings and Addresses of the American Philosophical Association in which he suggested this explanation for the low proportion of blacks in philosophy. In the next issue, the editor of the bulletin reported that Levin's letter has provoked the largest and most impassioned outpouring of letters I have yet received. The members of Levin's philosophy department at City College of New York published a letter distancing themselves from his views. Eighteen reactions were published, all of them negative, with some authors expressing strong disagreement and others condemning the APA for publishing Levin's letter and calling it racist propaganda. Needless to say, Levin was not invited to respond to this barrage of attacks, although this is a customary courtesy extended to authors who generate a controversy. A similar case, in which a prominent philosopher makes a late appearance, involves Frank Ellis, a former lecturer in Russian and Slavonic studies at the University of Leeds, who publicly expressed agreement with Richard Herrnstein and Charles Murray's claims, made in their controversy-generating book The Bell Curve, 1994, about the black-white difference in intelligence and its social effects. In response, the student union urged the administration to fire Ellis. The vice chancellor of the university suspended him from his duties pending the outcome of a disciplinary process. At a meeting of the Association of University Teachers, AUT, which was supposed to decide whether to offer assistance to Ellis in his attempt to keep his job, a delegate from Leeds, Gavin Reed, said, he wished Dr. Ellis would crawl back into the pond from which he came, and let us hope Leeds does the right thing and kicks this bastard out. What is most interesting for us is that the AUT stance was defended by Stephen French, a philosopher of science who at the time happened to be the vice president of the AUT University and College Union. Here are his words. Leeds AUT University and College Union concurs that the university as a public body has a duty under the law to promote equality of opportunity and good relations between persons of different racial groups. It also agrees that the university should place appropriate responsibilities upon its staff as part of its wider race equality policy. The bottom line is, why should we have to work and study with racists and homophobes? The answer is, we should not. Notably, French is currently editor-in-chief of the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, a top journal in the discipline. Given his treatment of Ellis, could French be expected to show minimal fairness as an editor if he had to evaluate an article that took seriously or, God forbid, defended the ideas from the bell curve? Possible, but that's not the way to bet. In contrast to French, who argued, in his role as a union member, that Ellis deserved to be fired for his offense, here is the opinion of David Bernstein, a law professor and expert on issues related to freedom of expression. Note that there was no finding of academic misconduct, no finding that Dr. Ellis had engaged in bad scholarship, and no finding that he had harassed, discriminated against, or even addressed his comments to any student. Rather, he is being disciplined solely because students found his views offensive, and thus a breach of the university's obligation to promote racial harmony, which sure seems to imply a heckler's veto for any controversial statements related to race. Troubling, indeed, published on the Legal Scholar's blog, The Volokh Conspiracy, March 26, 2006. The Curious Case of Gottlob Frege
Another illustration of the ideological bias in philosophy is the treatment of the person who is generally regarded as the father of analytic philosophy. The German philosopher and mathematician Gottlob Frege, 1848-1925. Especially relevant here is the contrast between the philosopher's vehement condemnation of Frege's political views and the almost total lack of criticism of no less contemptible political opinions of some other prominent philosophers. Why did the dogs bark so loudly just in this one case? The most salient factor that makes Frege stand out from all those other philosophers discussed in this book and might explain the asymmetry is that he has been castigated for supporting what is regarded as an extreme right-wing view. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on Frege states, Unfortunately, his last years saw him become politically conservative and right-wing. His diary for a brief period in 1924 show sympathies for fascism and anti-Semitism. Why is it deemed unfortunate that in his last years Frege became politically conservative and right-wing? What exactly is unfortunate about that? The word unfortunately could be appropriate if it referred to the brief period in 1924 when Frege expressed extreme and generally unacceptable political views, but it seems hardly justified if it refers, as it apparently does, merely to the fact that in his last years, plural, Frege became politically conservative and right-wing. Leftists might find this regrettable, of course, but why would this kind of partisan disapproval find its way into the most important reference work in philosophy? It is hard to imagine an article in the SEP or any other high-profile philosophical publication in which a biography of a famous philosopher would contain a similar sentence but with the following left-right inversion. Unfortunately, X's last year saw him become politically progressive and left-wing. What makes this example particularly striking is that the article on Frege with this gratuitous political comment was authored by Edward Zalta, the principal editor of the SEP. It was Michael Dummett who first drew public attention to the diary notes in which Frege, a year before his death, defended strongly anti-Semitic views. Upon discovering this, Dummett called Frege's political views very distasteful and was deeply shocked and very, very upset in an interview for a Philosophy Bites podcast. Notice, again, that no one has used the word distasteful, let alone very distasteful, and no one has been shocked, let alone deeply shocked, nor upset, let alone very, very upset, over any of the aforementioned cases of leading philosophers publicly supporting murderous totalitarian regimes of the left. Dummett, 1973, says he regrets that the editors of Frege's Nachlass chose to suppress the part of the diary containing the controversial political views. As one commentator observed, the charge of suppression always has odious connotations, and in a scientific and scholarly context, smacks of an accusation of intellectual dishonesty. The editors justifiably protested, and in response to Dummett's accusation, said the diary entries in question were left out simply because they contained statements of political attitudes which cannot be counted as part of the scientific knocklass. After all, other parts of the diary were also omitted for the same reason of being considered irrelevant, such as Frege's thoughts about the life of Jesus, the notion of justice, his teacher Professor Ab, etc. Besides, Dummett failed to notice that in Frege's Nachgelassene Schriften, which he criticized so harshly, the editors explicitly wrote that their goal was to prepare a complete edition of Frege's extant scientific writings and letters. 2. So a very clear and pertinent reason was given at the time for not publishing Frege's political thoughts from his diary, no one suppressed anything. The UC Berkeley philosopher Hans Sluge makes an even stronger charge. In his diary, Frege also used all his analytic skills to devise plans for expelling the Jews from Germany and for suppressing the Social Democrats. I cannot discuss Sluga's accusation here more closely, but I think it is not supported by Frege's text either. I am not alone in this judgment. In the opinion of Richard L. Mendelssohn, a Frege expert and the translator of his diary, Sluga's final sentence presents a gross distortion of the content of the diary. Sluga went further and claimed, also relying on Frege's diary, that one of Frege's heroes at the end of his life was Adolf Hitler. In fact, there is no textual evidence to support this accusation.
Similarly, the philosopher Avram Stroll stated that something close to admiration is implied in the following sentence from Frege's diary. Adolf Hitler writes correctly in the April 1924 issue of Deutschlands Erneuerung that Germany no longer had a clear political goal after the departure of Bismarck. But Stroll's comment is patently false. Agreeing with Hitler's claim about a political disorientation in post-Bismarck Germany in no way implies support for Hitler's politics and certainly not something close to admiration for him. The well-known and widely respected ethicist Jonathan Glover quotes the same sentence from Frege's diary that mentions Hitler. Since Glover presents this quote without any comment, it very much seems that, in the context of his strong condemnation of Frege's political views, the function of the quote is to make it appear that Frege supported Hitler. But again, in this particular instance, what Frege agreed with was Hitler's rather innocuous and probably true statement about Germany, see above. It had nothing whatsoever to do with National Socialism. Moreover, immediately before that passage, Frege expressed disagreement with the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, Hitler's most important political action up to that time. Oddly, Glover failed to mention this statement by Frege, although it would clearly help the reader to get a truer and more balanced picture about Frege's relation to Hitler. Glover is also grossly unfair to Frege when he writes, because of Frege's merit as a philosopher, his failure in the face of Nazism is more troubling than Heidegger's. I agree that Frege is a much greater philosopher than Heidegger, but it is hard to see how this can make his politics more troubling than Heidegger's. For, in contrast to Heidegger, who publicly supported the Nazi party for years after it came to power and after its policies left no doubt about its true goals and methods, Freig was jotting notes in his private diary nine years before Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany and more than one year before Mein Kampf was published. Frege's chief sin was anti-Semitism, but we should not forget that historically anti-Semitism has not been exclusively a right-wing phenomenon. In Frege's time, in particular, negative attitudes toward Jews were widespread across the political spectrum, not only in Germany, but also in other European countries. Like the left in France and Germany, the British left played a central role in the popular dissemination of anti-Semitism in late 19th and early 20th century Britain. Some scholars say that the degeneration of the left in this respect already started with the 19th century seedbed of anti-Semitic socialism, while others argue that the widespread repugnance of the left toward Jews had several roots, one of which was the historically documented affinity between anti-capitalism and anti-Semitism. This affinity dates back at least as far as Karl Marx's essay on the Jewish question, first published in 1844, and has been preserved among a number of contemporary leftists. One of many examples is the following statement of Ulrike Meinhof, the well-known German terrorist and co-founder of the Red Army Faction, RAF. Auschwitz meant that six million Jews were killed and thrown on the waste heap of Europe for what they were considered money Jews. Finance capital and the banks, the hard core of the system of imperialism and capitalism, had turned the hatred of men against money and exploitation and against the Jews. Anti-Semitism is really a hatred of capitalism. In light of such statements, it should not come as a surprise that after the end of the Bader meinhof group, some of its former members made a smooth transition to the extreme right and joined neo-Nazi groups. All this shows that in the end, despite appearances to the contrary, even Gottlob Frege fails to be an example of a leading analytic philosopher whose reason went on holiday because of the support for a distinctly right-wing political idea. The uncharitable approach to Frege by Dummett, Sluga, Glover, Zalta, and others may be a reflection of a widespread and familiar phenomenon. What is perceived as a right-wing deviation is not easily forgiven in contemporary philosophy. In contrast, much worse left-wing sins are typically passed over and excused. A good illustration of this bias is again Glover's book Humanity, 1999. More than a third of the 464-page book is taken up by parts 5, Stalin and his hairs, and 6, The Nazi Experiment. 
The part about Nazism has an entire chapter, titled Philosophers, in which Glover criticizes the political views of Heidegger and Frege, as well as those of some obscure philosophers like Alfred Bäumler and Lothar Tarala. In contrast, Glover did not include a philosopher's chapter in the part about Stalinism and Maoism, although it would have been easy to produce a much longer list of well-known philosophers who had fallen under the spell of communist totalitarianism. The names that come to mind include Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Bedieu, Lukacs, Bloch, and many others, not to mention any of the analytic philosophers shown here to have also succumbed to the same totalitarian temptation from the left. Neurath, Russell, Wittgenstein, Lakatos, Cohen, Putnam, Davidson. Yet that chapter remained unwritten, and Glover never explained why philosophers deserved a whole chapter in one case, but not in the other. Nixon or Cleaver, that is the question. In their academic, non-political work, philosophers become successful when they present arguments their colleagues find persuasive or worth discussing. As a rule, one is rewarded for presenting good arguments. With political views, it is different. The opinions here tend to be held passionately, judicious arguments do not have so much force, and animosity is often freely expressed. Since there is strength in numbers, it is leftists who mainly resort to invective. For instance, here is what the well-known philosopher Richard Rorty said in an interview for The Believer in 2003. I think all that September 11 changed was to give the fascists a chance. The Republicans saw that if they could keep us in a state of perpetual war from now on, they could keep electing Republicans more or less forever. Notice how fascists at the end of the first sentence becomes Republicans at the beginning of the next sentence. Rorty surely could not have believed that Republicans are fascists, but he nevertheless dropped the F-word, probably expecting, with good reason, that many of his readers, including his philosopher colleagues, would appreciate the barb. Elsewhere, Rorty associated Republicans with Hitler and the Nazis. When I heard the news about the Twin Towers, my first thought was, oh God, Bush will use this the way Hitler used the Reichstag fire, interview in The Progressive, June 2007. My first thought on hearing the news of 9-11 was the Bush administration would use this as the Nazis used the Reichstag fire. And that, I think, is pretty much what has happened in a talk in Potsdam, March 4, 2004, posted on YouTube. So Rorty's reaction on hearing about 9-11 was an intense fear that Bush would use the murder of 3,000 of his compatriots as a welcome opportunity to behave like Hitler. I find it odd not only that he had this thought at all, but in particular that this was his first thought after learning about such a catastrophic event. I assumed initially that reasonable people or reasonable philosophers would have to agree that comparing Bush to Hitler is simply over the top. But I soon discovered in 2007 that this was not true. In an email correspondence with a distinguished New York philosopher, whose academic work I very much admire, at one point our conversation turned to politics. I mentioned Rorty's comparison of Bush to Hitler as an example of how prominent philosophers can make wild and evidently untenable political claims. Surprisingly, my correspondent defended the comparison and argued that, in view of what he regarded as Bush's consistent record of anti-democratic moves, serious people could justifiably fear that Bush might attempt to hold on to power illegally, even after the completion of his second term. Now this would indeed be an important similarity with the Führer. But I remember that at the time, despite considerable effort, I just couldn't picture Bush appearing on Fox News, where else, announcing that the election of 2008 was to be canceled. That someone's distrust of Republicans could go so far that they would take seriously the possibility of a Bush coup d'etat is of course stunning, particularly because this came from an extremely subtle thinker who is otherwise a model of rationality. In contrast to Rorty's statements quoted above that illustrate the leftist political bias in philosophy, Rorty was sometimes only a witness to such bias. In the already mentioned 2003 interview with The Believer, he recalls the political climate in the philosophy department at Princeton in 1968. I remember sitting around the Princeton philosophy department lounge in 68 
and I turned out to be the only person in the room who was voting for Humphrey. The question was whether to vote for Eldridge Cleaver or Jesse Jackson. I suggested that perhaps one should vote by figuring out who one thought would do the best job as president, and everybody just smiled at me. Correction is in order here. Jesse Jackson was not running for president in 1968. But who was Eldridge Cleaver? He emerged from prison in 1966 after spending nine years there for rape and assault with intent to murder. He then joined the Black Panthers and became a presidential candidate of the Peace and Freedom Party in 1968. Rorty's story should not be immediately accepted as true, especially because it is well known that he had serious conflicts with many of his colleagues at Princeton before he left that department. Yet it seems to me unlikely that what he reported is a total fabrication. After all, he knew that many of the people involved in the story were still alive and that they could dispute it vigorously if it were untrue. So I decided to check. I contacted a few philosophers who were listed on the Princeton website as having been members of the philosophy department in 1968. I asked them for their opinion about Rorty's claim. The most interesting response came from XY, one of the most influential philosophers today. It would be inappropriate to give his name since this was a private email exchange. XY's first comment was, I can't recall knowing of any of my colleagues voting for Cleaver, and it seems to me unlikely. In fact, the unlikely did happen. Out of the three replies I received from former Princeton philosophers from 1968, a very prominent one did confirm that he himself had voted for Cleaver. And the last respondent, also a highly esteemed philosopher, expressed some doubt about Rorty's statement, but still conceded that it may well be that in 1968 more members of the Princeton philosophy department voted for Cleaver than for Nixon. This would in itself confirm the stunning left radicalization of Princeton philosophers and would indicate that there was indeed a huge political rift between the Princeton philosophical community and the rest of the American population. Since Nixon received more than 43% of the vote versus Cleaver's 0.05%, this would imply that the Nixon-Cleaver voting ratio among Princeton philosophers would have been, at the very least, about 1,000 times lower than the same ratio in the general electorate. XY's second comment, if any did vote for Cleaver, it would have just been as a protest vote, not expressing the view that he was suitable to be president. This response, I think, tells us much about the political mindset of many contemporary philosophers discussed here. Casting a vote for Cleaver merely in protest against the candidates who had a real chance of being elected in 1968, Nixon, Humphrey, and perhaps Wallace, would make political sense only if the protest candidate embodied some values that would point a way out of the allegedly hopeless politics represented by the main contenders for the presidency. But it is hard to see how Cleaver, with his rape conviction, could have embodied the hope of representing these new political values. He did not even deny the deeds that landed him in prison. On the contrary, he described them and their political rationale in his autobiographical book, Soul on Ice. I became a rapist. To refine my technique and modus operandi, I started out by practicing on black girls in the ghetto, in the black ghetto, where dark and vicious deeds appear, not as aberrations or deviations from the norm, but as part of the sufficiency of the evil of the day. And when I considered myself smooth enough, I crossed the tracks and sought out white prey. I did this consciously, deliberately, willfully, methodically. Rape was an insurrectionary act. It delighted me that I was defying and trampling upon the white man's law, upon his system of values, and that I was defiling his women. Although Cleaver renounced his rapist past in the book, it remains inexplicable how voting for a person with such a heinous record could be regarded as a meaningful protest against anything. It should be stressed that Cleaver's book came out in February 1968, more than eight months before the election, so the information about his raping career, including both its practicing stage, when black women were the victims, and the insurrectionary stage, when the prey were white women, was publicly available information at the time. How could people on the left, with their strong identification with feminism, 
be recruited to support a former sexual predator for president? The simplest answer is that for many leftists, race trumps sex. But Cleaver's negatives were not related just to his distant past. His political program openly announced mayhem. Seven months before the election, Cleaver said in a speech, now there is the gun and the bomb, dynamite and the knife, and they will be used liberally in America. And these were not empty words. Soon Cleaver and 12 other Black Panthers ambushed policemen in Oakland, California, apparently in retaliation for the assassination of Martin Luther King. In the exchange of fire that followed, one Panther was killed while two policemen and Cleaver were injured. Oddly, even this violent criminal act in broad daylight did not discourage some people, and apparently a number of philosophers, from supporting him in the election. On the contrary, the campus newspapers of two Ivy League universities recommended to its readers that they vote for Cleaver rather than for any of the major presidential candidates. The Harvard Crimson advised that one should vote to the left of the major three candidates, whether it be for Eugene McCarthy, Eldridge Cleaver, Dick Gregory, Fred Halstead, socialist worker, or Henning Blomen, socialist labor. And that, in states like Massachusetts, where no left-wing candidates qualify for the ballot or for a legal write-in, one should refuse to vote for the presidency. The Columbia Daily Spectator went even further and officially endorsed Cleaver. Notably, the editors did not envisage this as a protest vote. Rather, they claimed that the mindful American should cast a vote only if there is a candidate whose character and philosophy are intellectually and morally sound. And they said that in their opinion, such a man indeed exists. His name is Eldridge Cleaver. The day the newspaper endorsement was published, the candidate gave a speech on the Columbia campus in front of an enthusiastic audience and revealed his sound character and philosophy. We'll burn this motherfucking town all the way everywhere if we can't get the programs to reconstruct it, he said. We don't need any more sick wars on poverty. We need a war on the rich. The crowd in Woolman interrupted Cleaver's speech several times to applaud his comments, and at the close of the talk, most of the students rose from their seats and clapped for several minutes for the fourth party candidate. Throughout his speech, Cleaver denounced the pigs of the power structure, a term he uses freely at his public appearances to refer to the police and other officials. At the close of his speech, Cleaver led the crowd in Woolman in three verses of his campaign song. While the candidate directed the verses from the stage, students yelled, fuck Ronald Reagan, fuck Courtier, and fuck all the pigs. What conclusions can we draw from all this? First, that contrary to XY's claim, Cleaver was certainly not the sort of public figure for whom a reasonable person could ever cast even a protest vote. How could one explain such a protest to the many women who were raped by Cleaver, or to the policemen who were seriously wounded in an unprovoked attack that was organized by Cleaver, or to those who were disgusted by the fact that after the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the Black Panther Journal published a drawing of him as a dead pig? And second, it seems clear that the support Cleaver received in American universities arose from much more than a mere protest mentality. As we saw, there was a lot of genuine enthusiasm and excitement about someone who was finally breaking with a politics widely perceived as offering no real choice. According to studies of the political attitudes of American professors at the time, the proportion of the professors' vote for the far-left candidates, including Cleaver, in the 1968 presidential election was about 10 times higher than in the general population. Taking into account that the discipline of philosophy, as most other areas in the humanities, leans much further to the left than the professoriate in general, the proportion of philosophers who voted for the extreme left, including Cleaver, was probably substantially higher. This is one of many illustrations of very clever people behaving very foolishly. Why does this happen? And then he started to cry. A possible explanation draws on two facts. On one hand, the strong leftist bias in philosophy, and on the other hand, the philosopher's ability to concoct seemingly good arguments, even for rather implausible or sometimes even preposterous views.
Living in a bubble and spending most of their time with politically like-minded leftist colleagues will cause even very clever people to start hyperbolizing the dangers and bad effects of right-wing politics to such an extent that it may reach comical proportions, such as seriously worrying that George W. Bush might cancel the election and appoint himself dictator. Another good illustration is David Albert's account of his 1992 conversation with Sidney Morgenbesser, an iconic figure in analytic philosophy and one of the sharpest minds in that whole tradition. Three, I remember Sidney and I sitting together in my office in 1992 on the morning after Clinton was elected. Neither of us had any illusions about Clinton, but both of us were caught up just then in the immense relief of Bush's having lost. We were laughing and happy, and all of a sudden, Sidney starts to vetch. He said, I can't tell you what it's been like for me. I can't tell you how I have suffered these past 12 years under Reagan and Bush. And then he started to cry. At that, the floor just sort of came out from under me. I didn't quite know what I was in the presence of, and I didn't quite know what to do. Obviously, Morgan Besser must have sincerely felt these powerful emotions that brought him to tears. But it is equally obvious that Albert, his close friend and apparently a fellow liberal, could not make any sense of this reaction. And the reason he could not is simply that in objective terms, the reaction made no sense at all. For what on earth could Morgan Besser have imagined himself to have suffered so much under those two Republican presidents? If you are mainly surrounded by people who strongly lean to the left for, and who, living largely in the political echo chamber, tend to radicalize themselves more and more in the same direction, there will be a social reward for producing a new argument for distancing oneself even further from those on the other side of political spectrum. Indeed, on lighterreports.typepad.com, the most visited philosophy blog on the internet, which most philosophers check regularly to get professional news about their discipline, new hirings, changes in the expert ranking of top philosophy departments, professional gossip, etc., conservatives have been routinely referred to as repugs, morally depraved, morally deranged, crackpots, lunatics, idiots, twits, nuts, slimy, stupid, crazies, villains, moral monsters, fools, fascistic psychopaths, Neanderthals, despicable Neanderthals, sociopaths, threats to humanity, morons, dishonest scumbags, right-wing slime artists, noxious right-wing creeps, and brainless fascist thugs. The blog's hostility to conservative politics is hard to describe. It once went so far that the blog owner, University of Chicago professor Brian Leiter, linked in a 2007 post to a list of the 50 most loathsome people in America. And after recommending crude and insulting descriptions of a few politicians disliked by the extreme left, he drew the reader's attention to apt comments about the popular talk show host Rush Limbaugh, which contained the following sentence. It's hard to believe this repulsive shit fountain is even human, until you remember that we share 70% of our DNA with pigs. Another comment, also called apt, about the conservative columnist Ann Coulter is so tasteless that it is simply unquotable. The fact that the philosophical community had no problem at all, until recently, with enabling such an extremely intolerant and politically unhinged person to play an important role in the profession, tells us enough about how bad the situation is. All those scholars who served as evaluators for the ranking of philosophy departments, or who provided other disciplinary information for the blog, were apparently unbothered by the fact that the results of their professional efforts would later be presented and mixed together with wild and uncontrolled outbursts against public personalities and colleagues with different political views. It would be unimaginable for philosophers to agree to cooperate in the same way with and give so much power to someone who would use his blog to repeatedly call leading Democrats threats to humanity or morons, describe Paul Krugman as a moral monster, or find it appropriate to refer to Michael Moore as this repulsive shit fountain. For all we know, some of Leiter's collaborators may have been put off by his frequent political fits, but if such people existed, their irritation did not reach the level that would lead them to publicly voice concern or issue public criticism.
Since most of them are liberals who often share the same antipathy toward conservatives, they apparently don't realize how bizarre it will look to an impartial outside observer that one whole academic discipline, claiming to carry the torch of Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, allows its key source of professional information to be constantly marred by childish name-calling and gratuitous insults of people with certain political views. The recent massive criticisms of Leiter and requests that he stop playing such an important role in philosophy only strengthen my point, for they were triggered by his email exchange with a female colleague in which he, many thought, threatened to harm her career in retaliation to what she had written about him on her blog. As a result, more than 600 philosophers signed a statement of protest and pledged not to provide volunteer work for the Philosophical Gourmet Report. Leiter's popular ranking of philosophy departments, as long as it stayed under his control, September Statement 2014. Consider the asymmetry. A single private email from Leiter, followed by a Twitter post, started this avalanche of outrage among hundreds of philosophers, but his years-long uncontrolled torrent of public insults directed at his conservative colleagues and Republicans was never seen as a problem. Also, while the philosophical community rose up in outrage over his, comparatively, slight rudeness toward a female philosopher, did anyone find anything objectionable when in 2007, Leiter publicly praised an extremely vulgar attack on a right-wing female columnist which, among other things, made fun of her breasts? No. Apparently, feminist sensibilities are not activated when crass and witless insults are being hurled at conservative women. One thing is undeniable. Without the support of a huge number of philosophers, Leiter would certainly not have been able to turn his blog into such a prominent platform for his political paroxysms. Some of his readers may have merely tolerated his vitriol, but many obviously reveled in it. Are all rich people thieves? Now back to the general theme and our attempt to explain why some philosophers act so foolishly when they enter politics. If people are largely exposed to only one point of view for a long time, it should not be surprising if they start uncritically rejecting other perspectives and if they fail to realize the weakness of some of the arguments for their own opinion. Therefore, the strong leftist bias among philosophers is certainly a part of the explanation of how some leading scholars in the field could have defended political positions that were, and are, manifestly unreasonable. But it seems this cannot be a completely satisfactory explanation. There must be something else at work as well. Consider first an interesting example involving Derek Parfit, one of the most influential living philosophers. It would be very hard to find an analytic thinker today who is held in higher regard. In June 2015, Parfit gave a talk at the invitation of the Oxford organization Giving What We Can, which tries to promote the most cost-effective poverty relief, in particular in the developing world. As has already been richly documented in these pages, it is exactly such occasions of political activism that tend to bring out the worst in philosophers, leading them to make extravagant feel-good statements and also to throw logic to the wind. At the beginning of his talk, Parfit says that according to William Godwin, if you walk past a beggar and you don't give him your coins, you're stealing. The money doesn't belong to you, because the beggar needs it more than you, so you're stealing. Immediately after citing Godwin's eccentric opinion that not giving to a beggar equals stealing from him, Parfit surprisingly goes on to agree with it enthusiastically. Well, that is actually what I feel we rich people in the world today are doing. We're not entitled to our vast wealth. And a minute later he adds, if people from sub-Saharan Africa came and started removing my property, I wouldn't feel that I had a right to stop them. So Parfit is arguing, first, that rich people are not entitled to their wealth, even if it is the result of their hard work. And second, he is making a much stronger claim that rich people are actually stealing from poor people. The charge of stealing appears to be based only on Godwin's rather flimsy reasoning, which Parfit seems to endorse, that if X needs your money more than you do, this by itself establishes that you are stealing it from X. What is the justification, though, for the weaker claim that rich people are not morally entitled to their wealth? 
Here is the way Parfit appears to reach that conclusion. The relevant sections are numbered for easier reference, and the two key terms are in italics. It seems to me fairly clear that the great wealth that we rich people have isn't in a moral sense ours to give. It's legally ours, but it's not morally ours. I'm not entitled to my vast wealth compared with these two billion people in Africa. Three, there's no way in which I've come to deserve it, and they haven't. Since two is what Parfit is trying to prove, and three says something at least superficially similar to two, it very much looks as if Parfit is offering three in support of two. But this is a fallacy, for even if the truth of three were established, this would not imply that two is true. In ordinary English, the primary meaning of being entitled to X, which coincides with Parfit's central interest here, is having a right to keep X. On the other hand, saying that someone deserves X usually means that one is worthy of X by virtue of some action or personal characteristic. Obviously, these are two very different things, and there is simply no way one can validly infer that one is not entitled to X from the mere fact that one does not deserve X. For example, if I win a million dollars in a lottery, or if I inherit this amount from my rich parents, arguably, I do not deserve this money, for I did nothing to really earn it. But this by no means proves that I am not entitled to it, i.e., that I don't have a moral right to keep it. To recapitulate, Parfit's statement, too, says something very radical and very controversial, namely that rich people don't have a moral right to keep their wealth. But why should we accept two? Parfit apparently tries to support it by adding statement three, that the rich do not deserve their wealth, presumably because their wealth, especially compared to the poverty of those in Africa, is largely due to their pure luck of having been born in environments full of opportunities. The problem with Parfit's logic is twofold. First, he provides no real evidence, let alone compelling evidence, for the sweeping assertion three, and second, even if he did, two would still not follow. Another question. If Parfit genuinely believed that he had stolen his house, car, money, etc. from others, isn't it clear that he wouldn't continue to hold on to all those things? He is obviously not the kind of person who would keep something he himself regarded literally as stolen. Hence, the very fact that he has been unable to renounce his possessions indicates that, in his heart of hearts, he does not truly believe that he stole them. If Parfit did believe this, though, it would have been extremely easy for him to restore justice in his own case. For after having publicly announced that he wouldn't stop the poor if they came to his place to remove his property, the only thing that remained for him to do in order to facilitate a quick and rightful restitution was to disclose to the world the address of his Oxford residence, which he has not done. Notice, however, that Parfit is not talking only about Parfit. He is talking about all well-to-do people in the West. Consequently, the import of his statement is far-reaching. His view implies that if millions of sub-Saharan Africans came to the United States, Canada, Australia, England, France, Germany, and Italy, not only would they have a moral right to remove property from rich and well-off households in those countries, the local people would have a moral duty to invite these newcomers into their homes and ask them to take away all the stuff that the current owners had stolen from the needy. Such a radical approach to economic redistribution is almost unheard of. In terms of ordinary political taxonomy, it is best classified as belonging to the extreme fringe of the extreme left. To conclude, here is a concise evaluation of Parfit's view very high on compassion for the downtrodden, very low on logic. Let the massacre begin, said the ethicist. Another example is provided by the philosopher Jeremy Waldron, professor at the New York University School of Law, and until recently, Chichel Professor of Social and Political Theory at All Souls College, Oxford. Waldron participated in the debate, Is Torture Ever Permissible? at Columbia University, on April 21st, 2005. In the meantime, the video of the debate disappeared from the internet, but I saved the file on my hard disk. Since Waldron is well known for his absolute condemnation of torture under any circumstances, he was inevitably asked about the notorious ticking bomb scenario. What would Waldron's advice be 
if a nuclear device were planted in New York City and if the only way to save millions of innocent people from a certain and horrible death were to torture an arrested terrorist who knew the location of the bomb? He replied that the answer is clear. Since morality tells us there are certain things that must not be done under any conditions, and torture is one of those things, then it follows that in that kind of situation we should take the hit and let all these millions of people die. I find Waldron's response astonishing. I expect you do too. Notice that he is not saying merely that there should be an absolute and unconditional legal prohibition of torture, which would be a rationally defensible position. And he is not taking the cop-out approach of claiming that the ticking bomb scenario is implausible and for that reason refusing to give an answer, or claiming that we could never be in an epistemic position to know that torture would be necessary to save lives. Rather, he is talking about the strict moral prohibition that is binding in any imaginable case, without exception. He is saying that if he had to choose between one, saving millions of lives in the only way possible by applying rough treatment, say, waterboarding, which he regards as torture, to one of the organizers of the impending nuclear attack on New York, and two, protecting the perpetrator from any mistreatment with the result that millions of people would die, he would choose. Furthermore, he insists that in that situation, it would be immoral not to make that choice. Now, I simply do not believe that even an Oxford philosopher could be so out of his mind as to be really capable of choosing two if confronted with the above dilemma in actuality. Surely, at the critical moment, the proper priorities would kick in and Waldron would come to his senses and do the right thing. Outside of philosophical fantasies and back in the real world, no humane person could refrain from causing a murderous terrorist some physical discomfort if this were the only way to avoid the apocalyptic massacre. Excellently wise and excellently foolish. Question. How could a highly intelligent person like Waldron publicly and persistently defend such a nutty idea in the first place? Before trying to give an answer, let us first expand the question. Drawing on the episodes described earlier in this book, there are more puzzles of the same kind. How is it possible that other extremely smart people managed to believe, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that, among other things, the existence of the Iron Curtain was to be blamed on the United States, that Enver Hoxha's regime in Albania was great, that all rich people in the West are thieves, that those convicted in the Moscow show trials were guilty as charged, that an appropriate reaction to the collapse of Soviet communism was a feeling of loss, that there was no reason to join the war against Hitler until June 22, 1941, and that the United States in the 1950s was as much a police state as Hitler's Germany. Perhaps we should challenge the premise of these questions. The assumption here seems to be that what is especially odd about all these examples is that such highly intelligent people held such absurd opinions. But what if, on the contrary, it is precisely such very smart individuals who are especially prone to exhibit certain types of irrationality? What if there are follies that often spare ordinary people while more easily afflicting exactly those who are exceptionally bright, highly educated, and presumed to be extraordinarily sophisticated. This possibility was first suggested in the 17th century by Thomas Hobbes in the following remarkable passage. For between true science and erroneous doctrines, ignorance is in the middle. Natural sense and imagination are not subject to absurdity. Nature itself cannot err, and as men abound in copiousness of language, so they become more wise or more mad than ordinary nor is it possible without letters for any man to become either excellently wise or, unless his memory be hurt by disease or ill constitution of organs, excellently foolish. Notice the contrast Hobbes draws between two kinds of people, those with natural sense and imagination, who are not subject to absurdity, and those who abound in copiousness of language, and who will tend to become either excellently wise or excellently foolish. The expression, abound in copiousness of language, happens to connect very well with some of the main characteristics of analytic philosophers, or at least the characteristics they try to inculcate in themselves. 
analytic philosophers are supposed to be able to make subtle semantic distinctions, follow and evaluate convoluted arguments, excel in conceptual analysis, notice hidden ambiguities, detect fallacies and sources of linguistic confusions, exhibit verbal fluency, and so on. In accordance with what Hobbes says, philosophers are also good both at becoming excellently wise in their strictly philosophical area of specialization and excellently foolish in politics, as numerous examples in this book illustrate. The fact that they are excellently wise in their domain of research requires no explanation. Philosophers tend to be very clever, so there is nothing surprising about the best of them being very successful when they apply their formidable abilities to solving philosophical problems. But the second part is puzzling. Why would very smart people tend to be excellently foolish? One answer is that they can simply get away with it. Being foolish in philosophy is immediately followed by a heavy penalty, loss of reputation, but being foolish in politics often incurs no cost at all, assuming, of course, that the foolishness is of the leftist variety. It can even be rewarded, as one may be cheered on by politically like-minded colleagues for displaying courage and willingness to stick it to the other side. And it is those most accomplished philosophers whose descent into politics will be especially appreciated, perhaps because their high intellectual prestige earned in their philosophical work will automatically add credibility to their political pontifications. It will be natural to assume that they arrived at their political views with the same reasonableness and critical spirit demonstrated in their academic publications. Moreover, crazy views, when they are defended by highly esteemed philosophers, will often start looking less crazy than they should. Many colleagues may be inclined to reason in the following way. I don't find their arguments very convincing, but perhaps I should rethink the issue. After all, they are very smart people, so there is possibly something more in what they say than I can see. As a result, radicalism will spread further or encounter less resistance. Besides, there will be no real disincentive for prominent philosophers to go out on a limb and advocate extreme leftist opinions without giving a lot of serious thought to these matters. Defending loony views will not have any immediate harmful effects because usually no one outside of academia will pay attention to what these philosophers are saying anyway, or these reactions will not matter much. It all becomes a game enjoyed by those inside the ivory tower, but largely irrelevant to the outside world. Nevertheless, it is a game that corrupts the mind. This is a betrayal of reason that, oddly, your philosopher colleagues will not hold against you. The philosopher F. H. Bradley famously defined metaphysics as the finding of bad reasons for what we believe upon instinct. The sin of the metaphysicians, according to Bradley, is that they bring in bad reasons to break the deadlock in a debate in which they should have remained agnostic. What the philosophers I've discussed in these pages did was worse. They actually had excellent and easily accessible reasons to be against the positions they adopted and which they continued to support with grossly inadequate arguments. So it is not that they should have remained merely agnostic. Given the readily available evidence, they should have rejected the views they so passionately defended. But they did not. On the contrary, they have been invoking logic, rationality, and critical thinking, all in the attempt to present their strongly held political delusions as the voice of reason.